the Celeste Fraser is the Estes Valley Watershed Coalition. And it's such an exciting time to be with this group. Um, most of you know what we do, but in case you don't, we are the ones who restored our watershed after the 2013 flood. And that was a big deal. Um, we're still, still weeding and planting new vegetation along the riparian areas. Uh, and now we've gotten into uh, wildfire mitigation. So we're working with foresters um, from Colorado and the feds, right? Yeah. yeah. To um, figure out how to keep our forests safe. We involve local landowners in that effort. So it's, uh, and we're getting grants constantly. A lot of the grants that we get require matching funds. And that's where you all come in. So what we're asking is for non-members to give us a donation. Um, it's not mandatory, of course, a $5 donation. Um, and that's where your money goes to match these grants that we get. Uh, our next talk in January is going to be uh, elk migrations. And that's January 11th with uh, Chase Rylands. Tonight's speaker, I'm so tickled to have Ellen Wall, Dr. Ellen Wall from CSU, who is a luvial geomorphologist. <laughs> <laughs> How the forces change the landscape. Um, I've been looking for a, a geologist for ages since I've been doing this. So here she is. I'll let her explain her work. Please welcome Dr. Ellen Walker. That, that is a mouthful when you say fluvial geomorphology. It's just being that study with this. Fluvial is river and geomorphology is form, so earth surface processes and forms. And I focus on river. And I, I was thinking when you were talking about the next talk, I was like, I thought the elk only migrated from one yard to another. Yard. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's happening back to uh, what it's elevation. <laughs> uh, so I was asked to talk about this topic, and I am a geologist, that's my background, my degrees, undergrad and graduate. But I do focus on contemporary processes, and the Earth is 4.5, 4.6 billion years old. I'm going to really brush over all the old stuff and focus on the more recent. But I do want to talk about the really old stuff briefly. So nice scenery to get us started. I'm going to talk about just four basic categories, but I'm much more on the last two. So deep history. <laughs> Uh, some of my colleagues say that the time period that I work in is, it's hard to say. Is it, uh, it is on. Is it okay. not working? Yeah. Be like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, can they hear me on Zoom without it? I don't think so, because I okay. just got a comment that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I tried to say was some of my colleagues um, just to and you know, going to say everything that I work on is kidney litter. Um, you know, it's just the stuff that's and it doesn't matter. <laughs> so the vast majority of geologic history is far older than what I focus on, which is called a quaternary. So it's the last two million years. And people talk about the ice ages. That was the first part of the quaternary. So it's the Pleistocene from 2 million to 10,000 years ago. The Holocene until just a few years ago, that was the most recent period of geologic time, but you may have heard of the Anthropocene, and people are still arguing about when that should start, but it's in recognition of the fact that we as humans dominate everything now from climate through geologic processes. We move more sediment, or glaciers, rivers, wind, anything you want to think about. We have completely altered the distribution of water on your surface. Right. I can keep going on, but that's the basis for the Anthropocene. So again, I'll talk about the deep history. The Pleistocene, uh, you might usually think of that upper photo that's from the, the Snowmass website from the excavations there of what it looked like in the Pleistocene, the mammoth, the mastodon. You may not think about the sand dunes that are Great Sand Dunes National Park, but much of Eastern Colorado had very active dunes during the Pleistocene. 
Uh, is anybody, I'm sure you're all familiar with Great Sand Hills, but is anybody familiar with the North Sand Hills up in North Park, the little game field in Jackson County? That's one of the relict game fields that was much, much larger prior to 10,000 years ago. As it's gotten warmer in the last 10,000 years, vegetation has established on a lot of those dune fields. If you ever fly out of DIA, either early in the morning or late in the afternoon and you have a window seat and you're not watching a movie or somebody next to you isn't asking you to put your shade down, you can see the relic dunes in eastern Colorado very nicely. Or if you drive out to the Nebraska or Kansas border, there are places that are truly flat as a pancake, but there are a lot of places where you'll start to see a little undulation when you look at the horizon. Those are all dunes that are just barely stabilized by vegetation now. So during the Pleistocene, there were a lot of dunes. Uh, the Holocene around here, I'm of course going to focus on the mountains. Um, a lot of beaver. I'm glad to see we have our mascot on the table over there. And uh, a lot more wood than we're used to seeing in the rivers. And then I'll talk about some of the things we've changed. So starting with deep history, and I just wanted to say I've um, written a couple of books about the park because I've been doing research here on the rivers for, <laughs> I can say it to this group, it's very embarrassing to say this <laughs> to students who are less than what I'm about to say. I've been doing this for 30 years. So I have, for an individual, kind of a long history with the parks rivers, and I've thought a lot about different time scales of change. So for the deep history, before the Ice Ages, there have been multiple Rocky Mountains, not just the ones we see today. And MA here is million years prior to now. So basically, there was a period when there were ancestral Rockies, or very early Rockies, that were uplifted 1.7 billion years ago, or 1,700 million years ago. There was a long period of stability in between. There was another period of uplift 300 million years ago. And then the most recent was between 75 and 45. And in between each of those periods of uplift, you had something closer to the Himalayas rather than today's Rockies, a really high, high relief mountain range. Once the uplift stopped, erosion started working on that. So I live in Fort Collins. I know I, probably most of you live up here, but some of you are very familiar with the base of the mountains. Everything we sit on there is the erosional sediment or the sediment that came off of these ancestral mountains. So there was this massive shedding of sediment to the east after each of these periods of uplift. And when I say massive, it's like I think of a giant wedge that goes from here down to the Colorado-Nebraska border, the Kansas border, it was coming out the Arkansas, the South Platte, those regions of contemporary Colorado. And have any of you heard of the Ogallala Aquifer? Yeah, it's pretty famous, um, mainly because of its problems. But an aquifer is just a, a portion of the subsurface that can contain a lot of water. There's enough pore spaces that there's porosity and permeability. It's like a sponge. Well, the Ogallala Aquifer is composed of sediment that was shed from these ancestral Rockies. So if you know, uh, you know Garden of the Gods, the Flatirons and Boulder, all the spectacular rock formations at the lower part of the mountains, sort of the foothills and transition zone, those are all erosional products from past episodes of the mountains that were carried east and then in their turn changed into rock. So coming back to the what's sometimes called the crystalline core, crystalline in the sense of granites, uh, some metamorphic rocks, so where we are now. If you, you're, and this is a fun fact to give to this group, if it's, you know these places very well. We have things like Long's Peak and Pikes Peak, but we also have a lot of mountains that are about the same elevation. Now, there, there are a few giants that stand up, but there are a lot that are kind of similar. And then there are these flat surfaces that you see along trail ridge. They're really high elevation, but they're very gently rolling. So these are the remnants of those episodes of past erosion. So imagine, you can all see my hand, hopefully people on Zoom can too, but if my hand is representing the ground surface and is deformed into a mountain range, when that uplift stops, my knuckles are vulnerable. They're going to get eroded. And so you may have something that you know, ends up more like this, but it's still high in elevation. So that's what we've got in much of the park, particularly in the alpine zone. We also have really old rocks. Uh, they're all what's called Precambrian in age. So they're on the order of 1.7 billion years old. And they've had a hard life. <laughs> There's 
Can you think of any rock face that doesn't have at least hairline fractures of it around here? And, and many of them, the fractures, the cracks are much bigger. There have been these multiple episodes of uplift, and if you lift up rock, it's subject to pressure and it cracks. And then once the uplift stops, again, the erosion starts. Erosion is facilitated by things like water that we're having tonight uh, in solid or liquid form, melting, infiltrating into those cracks. Of course, ice or water expands when it freezes, so the ice forces the rock apart. Plant roots do the same thing. Fires, just daily heating and thawing, they all gradually break down the rock. And they tend to do that by widening these little, what started as hairline fractures. So granite is very, very resistant rock, but we have granite that, again, has had a hard life. It's got a lot of cracks in it, and those cracks are zones of weakness. So that's important for a couple of things. One is that the granite is not evenly cracked. Um, I'm not sure I should use this an analogy because people on Zoom can't see it, but it, for those of you on Zoom, imagine three rows of chairs. The chairs are pretty evenly spaced, but there's some chairs that aren't occupied. So there's a difference in the density of people sitting in this room. If you think of cracks in bedrock, you can have lots of really closely spaced cracks, like the people who are sitting right next to each other. And then it's very common to have a section of the rock where the cracks are a little bit more widely spaced. So again, if you think of the cracks as zones of weakness, where they're all closely spaced, that rock is going to weather and erode faster. And you can see this really well wherever you go. This is uh, the Sky Pond, but the places where the cracks are farther apart, you tend to get the protruding topography. So ridges, peaks, spires, longs peak. The places where, actually, um, I just lose the name. South end of this is part of the all I could think of was Owl Ridge because I'm looking at that Owl <laughs> Lumpy Ridge. Yeah, it's lumpy because there are places where there's a nice, fairly smooth, rounded dome. The cracks are a little further <coughs> apart. And then there are other places like the talus slopes that you're seeing here or the recessed areas where those cracks or fractures are closer together and the rock weathers and erodes more rapidly. So as someone who looks at contemporary processes, I just sort of keep all this in mind in the background. This is the history of what's happened here, this is the signature that still exists in the topography. But the big drama in the last two million years, of course, was the Pleistocene Age glaciers. And this is a map of our area. You can see the Rocky Mountain National Park outlined in yellow. All the pale gray areas are the maximum extent of glaciation during the Pleistocene. So it's called the Ice Ages for a reason. There were huge ice sheets covering all of Canada, the northern fringe of the US. The Fenoscandian ice sheet in Europe was covering all of Scandinavia down into places like Germany. And in uh, mountainous areas south of those massive ice sheets, there were glaciers in the, the um, either right up at the Cirque or going down the valley. We never had glaciers that made it all the way to places like Fort Collins and Boulder. It was just too dry. But other mountain ranges did, the Sierras, for example, the glaciers made it to the base of the mountains. Our glaciers must have been very impressive when they existed, but they weren't very big by world standards. Again, it was just too dry. But between 2 million and 10,000 years ago, there were multiple episodes of these glaciers advancing and retreating. And this is not Rocky Mountain National Park, um, that's green, but it's more like what the park would have looked like. And there's a couple things you see here. This was the, the glaciers in Greenland, like everyone else, are retreating very rapidly. So these they're dirty looking because as the ice melts, the sediment that's in the ice is concentrated. But you notice there's sort of a flat area up here and then a very steep section and another flat area down here. Hopefully that seems very familiar because that step topography is what we have as a history of glaciation. So of course, this is looking down from Trail Ridge and some very small and then some of the, the main plates. Most of the valleys in the Front Range have this large scale stepping, like a stair step. And that's very characteristic of glacial topography. You get places where the glacier effectively very, the, the ice doesn't scoop up the, the underlying rock, but the sediment being dragged along by the ice does that. And then there are places where the ice goes over a very steep section. When the glaciers melt, the rivers start to modify this topography, but they're 
they're not quite as powerful as glaciers. Uh, and it's only been 10,000 years, which is nothing in geologic time. So we basically have uh, topography that's inherited from the glaciation in the Front Range now. Globally, there were at least four episodes of glacial advance and retreat during the Pleistocene. Here, we can only really pick out three. You can see the evidence of glaciers advancing and retreating much more readily in really flat topography if you have a continental ice sheet, because the ice sheet doesn't necessarily go in exactly the same path at the edges. If the ice is confined to a valley like this, when it advances again, it can just obliterate all the evidence of earlier glaciation, or at least make it really hard to see. So there's at least one prior to this, uh, maybe two, but the, the most recent are the Bull Lake, and those numbers are years ago. So 200,000 to 130,000 years ago, and Pinedale. And these are named after places. So you, I don't know if you know where Bull Lake is, but I bet you know where Pinedale is up in Wyoming. They're type localities. It's where this uh, period of glaciation, where the deposits were first described. So Pinedale is the most recent, 30,000 to 10,000 years ago, with the maximum ice at 18,000 years ago. So imagine here, I think most of you, or actually I shouldn't say that. I would strongly encourage you, if you haven't, to look at a geologic map of Rocky Mountain National Park. They, those maps show exactly how far the glaciers went. So they went to, right about here, um, if they went to about Estes, maybe a little bit higher in some valleys, a little bit lower, but we're right about the margin of glaciation. So imagine ice to the west of us, and then something more like tundra environment immediately to the east. And as you go down in elevation, going towards Fort Collins or Boulder, um, Loveland, et cetera, you gradually get into forests. And then you keep going east and you get into sand dunes. It wasn't wetter in the Pleistocene, it was just colder. So that's something that uh, I think a lot of people think if there was that much ice, it must have been a lot wetter, but it actually wasn't. Okay, so by 10,000 years ago, the glaciers are disappearing and we're moving into a different era, but the contemporary one. But what we see today is really that product of these interactions of climate, varying through the climate, most recently as expressed through the advance and retreat of glaciers, and then geology over much longer time periods, governing the distribution of different rock types and the topography, creating mountains and then long periods of weathering and erosion, uh, starting to modify those mountains and move a lot of mass to lower elevations. So I think of this as ice and rock setting the template for the contemporary landscape. So moving into what's called the Holocene, which is the last 10,000 years, we still have glaciation. It's, I find it a little hard to remember today because our glaciers are in the park or not. They're, they're very small remnant ice sheets and they're disappearing fast. But there have been uh, larger glaciers during the last 10,000 years than there are at present. They were smaller than the Pleistocene, but they existed. So what you're looking at here, the numbers on the vertical here are ages, and it's, it's 10 to the 30, just means thousands of years before present. So going from 12,000 years ago, right when the glaciers are retreating to the present. And this first column, each of these names is a period when smaller glaciers formed and went farther down the valley in the front range. And they're, again, names like Triple Lakes, Audubon, Arapahoe Peak, Satanta Peak. So what you see is there's periods where these little glaciers were advancing and then they disappear. And the Thermal here was a warmer, drier period. It's sometimes taken as an analog for what we're moving into now with anthropogenic or human caused climate change. It was warmer than at present. The second column is what was going on to the east of us. When the glaciers were advancing, it was cooler and just a tiny bit wetter. So you had periods of stability in the plains where soils would form, vegetation would cover those dunes as we have now. And then during the periods when it got much warmer and drier and the glaciers disappeared, you had active sand dunes in eastern Colorado or going out to the Sand Dunes region of Nebraska. And then this one's interesting. The prehistoric peoples who were living here moved up and down over long time periods. It, it's kind of common sense. When you've got glaciers advancing in the mountains, the population density gets greater at lower elevations. You've got sand dunes forming in eastern Colorado or shifting their elevation upward. 
So based on the chronology of archaeological sites, people were moving up and down in elevation over these thousands of years in response to these large climate changes. And you can think of this, if, if the Pleistocene was the era of glaciers, the Holocene, when mostly the glaciers are small or not around, is the era of rivers. So rivers are the big shapers of the landscape. And I had to put in debris flows and landslides because the Holocene is also the time of wildfires, the type of intense precipitation we had in 2013, and then all those landslides occurred, Twin Peaks, all the ones around North St. Brain, um, below Route 7, uh, the Big Horn area, the, you know, there were a lot of them. So that those would have occurred during the Pleistocene, but that they become progressively more important during the last 10,000 years when the glaciers are gone. And the rivers mostly look different than they do today, even though we're essentially in a contemporary climate because people weren't manipulating things yet. So uh, my shorthand for this is the rivers were messier. I challenge you to find an early description of any place in the US, the Southeast, the Northeast, the Mississippi Valley, the Pacific Northwest, the Rockies, the Gulf Coast, where the first people trying to follow the rivers didn't complain a lot about how difficult it was. They couldn't figure out where the river was. They were branch into multiple channels, or they couldn't figure out how to get around the next obstruction, the next big wood draft naturally occurring accumulation of wood, or the thousands of beaver dams in the smaller channels. They got sidetracked into floodplain lakes and ponds. It, the rivers and the river valleys looked very, very different prior to European settlement. So we have some analogs in the park. This, of course, is Wild Basin, as seen from the trail up to Sand Beach Lake. Beautiful beaver meadow complex. There's lots of standing water. There's, it's hard to see in this photo, but there's channels that branch and rejoin. This is down at river level. There's three channels coming together there. This is an example by what I mean by messy. And I can say that a little bit more technically and call it spatial heterogeneity. You know what homogeneity is. It's uniform. It's simple. Heterogeneity in the landscape means there's patches. And if I wanted to define those patches based on vegetation, where there's individual stands of willows down here, or the whole beaver meadow could be a patch if I'm looking at a coarser scale relative to the conifer forests on the lateral moraines on the other side. So the more a landscape differs from something that is simple and uniform, the greater the spatial heterogeneity. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on the rivers. So a lot of that heterogeneity was driven by things like log jams and the effect of uh, beaver, the modifications of beaver. So those two pictures were beaver. Um, an example of log jams, and these are of course all contemporary photos. This is Uzo Creek, just downstream from Uzo Lake. This, uh, I don't know if any of you remember this, this was a really impressive jam on uh, just below Alberta Falls. And it was there for many years. And I spent one summer tagging every log in there and surveying them, and then I came back and the whole jam was gone. <laughs> and that's what happens. Um, they're dynamic. They may last, but they've probably been there for a decade. Does, does anybody remember this jam? Have any of you seen it? What? Well, yeah. So, oh, I think it disappeared in 2006 or seven. It was a while ago. But it had been there for a while. <laughs> I came back and I couldn't, I couldn't say, am I in the right spot? He's <laughs> gone. Uh, and there was another one down below Route 7 that did the same thing. I changed my strategy. I had tagged with a lot of logs and a lot of jams, so I started doing things differently. Uh, this is up on North St. Green between Thunder Lake and where you pick up the trail if you take that little shortcut up to the campsites that uh, joins up with the Uzo Lake Trail. So the point I'm making here is that this is what a lot of rivers in the Front Range look like prior to intensive European settlement or, and manipulation. There's a lot more wood coming in. There were big jams that would flood the whole valley floor. That's what's going on here. There's logs accumulating throughout. These trees didn't germinate in saturated ground here. They were flooded subsequently. And you can still find places like this, particularly in old growth forest in the subalpine, which is where the Uzo Creek and North St. Rain Creek flows are from. But they're very rare outside of these areas. If you start looking at the national forest around here, it's going to be you're going to be very hard pressed to find this. So that brings us into the most recent thing, the Anthropocene, or the era of human modification. 
Rivers, I, I've been focusing on the Northern Hemisphere, but the Southern Hemisphere, there's a lot of the same thing. They've been simplified and homogenized. If you think about how we use rivers, we use them for navigation, large traffic, for example, or for exploration initially, we use them for, um, or we modify them for flood control, we use them for getting water from one place to another for irrigation and manufacturing, we use them for waste disposal, we want them to flow very quickly and uniformly and simply. So we make them like this. It doesn't look like this anymore. Um, there's been a restoration project. This is the river bluffs, the natural area in Port Charles. But in the 60s, that was channelized because of, I can't remember what county road it is. It's the road that crosses I-25 going between Port Collins and Windsor. So they wanted to protect the bridge on that road. So back in the 60s, they channelized this. And it, it's very straight and they built artificial levees to keep it from accessing the footprint over here. This is what a lot of rivers look like now, but this is, as it says, the Yukon River in Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska. And it's a nice example of what more rivers look like in the past. They had a lot of spatial heterogeneity. They branched into multiple channels that rejoined downstream. They were closely connected to the floodplains and had a lot of floodplain wetlands. There are different things that create that, but here, in the Estes region, two of the big drivers are beavers and large wooden channels or log jams. So we've had a very distinct loss of spatial heterogeneity in the channels and a loss of connection between the channel and the footprint. If you think about it, if I'm water moving downstream and I come to a beaver dam or a log jam, I can build up and get deeper upstream of that. But at some point, particularly during snowmelt peak flows, the water's going to go on the floodplain. If you take that obstruction out and make the river more uniform, the water stays in the channel. That's why we did all that channel engineering. And if you're thinking, oh, but we're in the national park, right? There's old growth, and people didn't do those things here. Um, anybody ever notice that nice little streak of aspens where there's no creek coming down a steep slope into Mill Creek? There was a sawmill there. <laughs> they slid, cut logs up there. There's a period of time where they were sending 200 to 300,000 cut logs a year down Big Thompson and down the Poudre to collection booms for sawmills around Greeley and Fort Collins. And I wrote this book back in 2001 because I did my undergrad and graduate work in Arizona. And when I, I grew up in Ohio, when I moved there, I thought, okay, it's the desert. The rivers are dry. It's the desert. But then I realized, I, I read and I learned, when people of European descent first came to Phoenix and Tucson, they had problems with malaria. There were beaver on the rivers. Those were perennial rivers. They had become ephemeral because of consumptive water use. Okay, that was startling. But then I moved here to Colorado and I said, oh, well, well, there's water in the river. These are natural mountain rivers. And then I started reading about these things. I read Fremont's description. If you read Fremont's description in 1842, he went up the Hooter catchment because, among other places, he talks about all the abandoned beaver lodges and beaver dams. It was a big deal when they found one that still had beaver. I read Edwin James, who was still seeing beaver in the Longs expedition in 1819. I read Pike, and Pike mostly, Zebulon Pike was mostly writing about trying not to starve to death or freeze to death. But the other two have a lot of natural history. And there are a lot of historical writings and photos. And it's pretty clear that the rivers around this area have changed a lot. There was, have any of you seen John Fielder's coffee table book of matched photos with um, the 1870s photos or the Devlin and Lawrence volume? There's massive deforestation in the front range. There are very few pockets of old growth. You can look at photos and say, oh, that's about timberline, and then you see all the stumps. Everything was cut. So, uh, virtual rivers is an exaggeration, but I uh, was making the point that these rivers that look beautiful and that look like they're natural have a long history of human restoration. So the Anthropocene in our era involved a lot of things, a lot of modification of the forest, but also certainly modification of the rivers, the, the channels and the footprints. <coughs> so when I think of river networks, particularly in the front range, I think of them as composable called beads and springs, and I didn't come up with these springs, but I think it's really useful for thinking about it. An example, this is from Google Earth, looking at North St. Grain Creek in Park. This is a string. This is the bead of the beaver meadow at the wild basin entrance. So beads and strings just refers to 
wider parts of the valley floor and then narrower parts, and they alternate as you go downstream. <coughs> and it was stream ecologists in Montana who first described this for the northern Rockies. And the reason they started talking about beads and streams was that the beads are really important. Those wide sections retain more. So, you know, everything in a river corridor that's inanimate, water, sediment, uh, dead leaves, pine cones, etc., things dissolved in the water, nitrates, phosphate, it's all moving downstream more or less. It, it doesn't do so very quickly necessarily, and it doesn't do so continuously in periods of storage, but it's moving downstream. If you have something like an irrigation canal or a channelized river, everything goes downstream fast. But if you have these naturally occurring beads, like the beaver meadow, the wild basin, things slow down. So it's more retentive. And if you stop things moving downstream, that gives a chance for a variety of living creatures to start to use some of that material. There are microbial communities that remove nitrate from water. And I'm, is there anyone who's never heard of the fact that we have a severe nitrate pollution problem in the park? Are you all aware of that? Okay, well, one of my colleagues at CSU and the USGS, Jill Barron, has been working in Lockdale for over 30 years. She has a long-term record of what is going on with water chemistry in the streams, in the lake, and in the soils. And it's just, nitrate is accumulating. It's coming from where I live. It's coming from the urban corridor at the base of the front range. It's coming out of our tailpipes and our um, use of fossil fuels. And it's coming from agricultural areas like the Piedmonts that are very common in that part of Colorado. It comes in on upslope winds. It gets deposited on the eastern side of the park. There, you might as well put a brick wall on the Continental Divide. The rate of nitrate deposition on the west side of the divide is a fraction of what it is on the east side. And it's all those upslope winds. So nitrate is a nutrient that all living organisms need. But it would be like eating a, uh, we all need food, but it would be like just eating constantly and become obese and then you kill yourself. You get too much nitrate in the system, and there's a couple things that can happen. If it's um, standing water, like a lake or a drinking water reservoir, this is a big problem for the drinking water supply at the base of the mountains. You have blue-green algal blooms. The, the algae says, huh, nitrate, yay, and they multiply like crazy. And then as they start to die, the decomposition of those algae takes dissolved oxygen out of the water, and that kills everything else. Fish, shellfish, aquatic insects uh, in their larval phase, they all need oxygen. Some types of blue-green algae also produce toxins. So those toxins can kill everything in the water, they can kill people drinking the water, have you heard of the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, or the hypoxia, the anoxic zone? That's a lot of nitrate coming down the Mississippi. It's a very common scenario in rivers throughout the industrialized world. There's too much nitrate coming out. There's two reasons for that. One is we put a lot of nitrate into circulation, mainly through fossil fuels and fertilizers. The other is we have mostly stripped the ability of these beads to biologically process that nitrate. So we limited the ability of plants and microbes to take up the nitrate because we put in something more like an irrigation canal through the center of the beads. And we haven't changed the valley geometry, but if you straighten this channel and put artificial levees on it, the water goes through fast, and there's no opportunity for that biological uptake. So we've limited the ability of river corridors to remove nitrate. So back to beads and streams in the front range. Um, again, they're, they're ubiquitous. Every river I've followed from its um, headwater lakes or subalpine lake down to the base of the park, you alternate between these little mini gorges and then these wide low gradient reaches that are the beads. Now, this is there's a lot, this is a little bit jargon, but retention here again is just slowing the downstream passage of whatever goes through the bead. That ability to slow that downstream movement reflects the patchiness or the spatial heterogeneity. And it also reflects whether you've got something that's just got longitudinal connectivity, so it just goes zooming downstream, end of story, or whether it can be connected laterally between the channel and the footprint, so it can move out across the valley floor. And vertical is the hardest one to wrap your head around, but 
if you have an irregular channel, so it's constricting, it's expanding, it's got fins, it's got big boulders here, or a log jam there, or a beaver dam, the water piles up against those obstacles and you create pressure. It's like if we all, bad analogy, but sorry, but if we all decided we had to get out that door right away, the people in the back would be creating pressure on the people in the front. In a stream, when you have an obstacle that's creating that pressure, some of the water can go into the stream bed. It actually goes into the subsurface, flows for some distance, and then returns to the surface. So vertical connectivity means that you have the ability for that to occur. And that's really important <coughs> because that subsurface area is called, it's a mouthful, but it's called the hyperreic zone. That's from Greek for flow below. Rios is flow, hypo is below. The better phrase that, yeah, this isn't my phrase, it's called the river's liver. So <laughs> water goes into the subsurface and there are a lot of things living in there, mostly microbes and bacteria, but also I've seen um, aquatic insect larvae this big come out of the groundwater well below a stream. It's kind of like, where did you fit in there? <laughs> the microbes in particular, they're taking up nitrate. Um, they're, they're getting dissolved oxygen in the water that goes down, but they're cleansing the water by removing some of the pollutants or potentially toxic materials before it goes back up into the stream. So if you've got, I keep using an irrigation canal because it's the straightest, most uniform thing I can think of. If you've got an irrigation canal, there's a little bit of water going to the subsurface, but mostly it just goes downstream. If you've got a beaver dam across a channel that's very sinuous and irregular, some of that water for sure is going into the subsurface. It's getting cleansed and then it's returning. So you want lateral and vertical connectivity. You want things to move between the channel and the floodplain and the surface and the subsurface. That slows down that downstream passage and allows various types of organisms like microbes to take up some of the things you don't want being concentrated downstream. Beads are also more resilient. Resilient gets used a lot. You know, we talk about resilient people, resilient communities, resilient infrastructure. In this context, a resilient natural system says, eh, fire, I don't care, I'll come back. Flood, I'll come back. It's the ability to recover after some extreme event. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by resilient. But let's start with just looking at a couple of these beads. So looking at the upper Colorado, this is a Google Earth view of Grand Lake. You can zoom in a little bit. And what I've highlighted in yellow here, all these lighter green patches, those are those wide flat areas in the river network. In between, you know, the river keeps going in between here and here, or this patch and this patch. But it's one of those steep, narrow streams. So if I zoom in more, uh, this is a good example along North Inlet Creek. You can see, you know, the channel is not straight and uniform. There's a lot of meander bends there. Um, probably 30 years ago, there were a lot of beaver dams and beaver ponds. This is what a stream looks like on the ground. These are north and north creek. It's steep, it's narrow, things are moving fast. There's no floodplain. This is a bee, an old uh, beaver dam and pond on the same creek. So things are moving slow, and there's a lot of storage and biological uptake. Now this one is. This next slide is a little intimidating, but um, it will become so in a moment. A three-dimensional block diagram of a river. So you're, you're at the channel, there's things at the subsurface, there's adjacent areas that's supposed to be an inflection point on the hill slope, there's a floodplain on the hill slope. Anybody looks at that and you say, okay, things are moving downstream. But what you have to think about is they're moving downstream, but they're also moving laterally. You know, we have snow melt, a big uh, rainfall, there's water flowing across parts of the surface. It's bringing some sediment, uh, particularly there's a lot of water. It's bringing what's called organic matter, so pine needles, pine cones, leaves, twigs, etc., into the river. There's water moving back and forth between the channel and the floodplain. And you keep going, and this is where I'm sorry, you have it being maybe more affinity, but it's just showing the three-dimensional nature of these exchanges. So there's deep water coming in. Is groundwater. There's that hyperreic water going into and out of the stream bed. In some places, the streams are losing water to the groundwater. There's subsurface exchange between the channel and the floodplain. There's surface exchange. So things don't just simply move downstream in the natural river. Um, if I like to do this because I talk about mesmerizing people, I'm going to hypnotize you. If flow is going from me to you, it doesn't just do that, it does something more like this. 
over longer time scales. So down in the subsurface, back to the surface, up, over to the floodplain, back to the channel. So a slow motion version of that. There is a downstream channel slope component overall, but there's a lot of stopping points along the way. So the beads have more of this. The strings, the steep narrow portions, things do mostly stay on the surface and move downstream fast. But if you've got a bead, it can be, have all those patches of vegetation and different types of sediment. So you can have more of that lateral and vertical exchange. And the, this is sometimes um, referred to as a river corridor perspective. If I say river, chances are you think channel. If you say river corridor, it's a little bit more explicit that you're acknowledging that that channel occurs in a context with the floodplain and that underlying material and that they are intimately connected. And I'm emphasizing this, hopefully it's not very obvious, but if you know anything about law in the US, and the US is very representative of other countries, what does the federal government have jurisdiction of? Navigable waters, period. Doesn't have any jurisdiction necessarily over floodplains. So legally, we separate floodplains from active channels. Uh, until the 90s, Colorado did not recognize legally, our, our state didn't legally recognize that groundwater and surface water were connected. They were treated as two separate bodies of water. So there is this perception that there's a channel and then there's other things. But in terms of how rivers actually operate, that channel is intimately connected to what's adjacent to it and what's below it. So another way to illustrate that, Seeds and streams, the really narrow, con uh, narrowly confined stream and the bead in between. Where you are in a river network and whether you have a bead or a stream is very important. What's coming through that? So water and sediment in all rivers, historically in forest rivers, large wood was much more abundant. There's far more wood in the channel than our log dams, and those play a very important role. And then living organisms. So in our part of the world, living riparian vegetation or riverside vegetation, and of course we were, were far more abundant. And you know, I, I've said that multiple times now, but, but to put this in perspective, I over the, since uh, about 2009, I have walked every major channel in Rocky Mountain National Park from the subalpine lake down to the park boundary. And I have yet to see one where I don't find evidence of old beaver dams. They were very confident. I find old beaver dams about places like um, the waterfalls on Cow Creek. Ooh, you trusted your dam. I mean, it's a few meters upstream from that waterfall. They were places that are not considered ideal for beaver. Maybe those were the two year olds that were leaving the colony and didn't survive very long, but they were ubiquitous in the park. Um, have any of you read Coyote Valley, the really nice history of the Kalanichi? We talk about how extensive the beaver meadows were on the western side, for example. They, they lasted longer over there, but uh, while that was still in private land, ranchers would target those because they were great hay meadows. So they'd kill a beaver and then use that wet meadow for hay production. I can't exaggerate how many more beaver there would have been here historically. If, if you haven't read In Beaver World by Eno Smills, it's a wonderful book, it's really fun. And he talks about things I can't imagine. He talks about dozens of beaver being attacked by a pack of wolves or by grizzlies. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing to see today? So the, the rivers in the park also look very different. Okay, so getting into this idea of spatial heterogeneity and patchiness, just zooming in on North Inlet Creek. Again, it's not straight, it's not the same width. You can see old channels that are abandoned, you can see differences in Sort of the roughness and the color of the surface that are reflecting that history of the movement of the channel back and forth and certainly um, modification by beaver. And we can go look at modern examples where the beaver are still present. So this is near Independence Pass. If you have been to this area, North Fork Lake Creek, there's just beautiful beaver meadows and beaver dams there um, that are still active. Going over to East Inlet Creek, um, this is an old beaver lodge. There's no beaver dams and I don't know of any contemporary beaver there. But we can use this as an example of this idea of connections between the channel and the adjacent environment. So there's material water, uh, whatever's dissolved in the water, sediment coming in from the adjacent uplands, both at the surface and the subsurface. There's that lateral connectivity between the channel and floodplain. There's 
everything inanimate moving downstream and some animate things, some fish moving upstream. There's vertical connectivity between what's above the surface and the ground surface, and then in the other direction into the groundwater or the hyperreic zone. So we don't usually think of this when we look at a photo like I first showed you, but if you start to understand how rivers work and what's important to maintaining them as healthy functioning ecosystems, then you really have to start thinking about these other influences. Do something up on the hill slopes, like completely deforesting it for timber harvest. It influences the water, the sediment, uh, the dissolved material coming into the river and definitely shows up in the river corridor. I use the term resilience before I said I'd return to it. So um, resilience to natural disturbances and the big ones for rivers around here, drought, fire, and flood. This beaver meadow, this is um, at the upstream end on the uh, north side. So the active channel is out of the photo, but it sits in the back here. This is an old abandoned beaver pond. It's, I don't know how long it's been since they were there, but at least a few decades. But it's still holding water. You can see other ponded water here. If there's a drought, there's an awful lot of water stored at the surface, in the shallow subsurface, and in the plants. The plants have higher moisture levels than they would without all of this beaver modification. If there's a fire, uh, there's a really great scientific paper called Smokey the Beaver. Uh, and it, one of the areas she used, it's Emily Fairfax is the author, um, and she did her PhD at the University of Colorado. She used sites in Colorado and other parts of the Northwest, and she showed that as you would expect, when there's a fire, we're going to burn through that. It may squirt some of the vegetation around it, but that's a really good buffer to any drier conditions, whether it's fire or not. It's a very good buffer to a flood. Um, I was desperate to get up here. I, I've been working here. I was just desperate to get up here after the 2013 flood. You may remember if you lived here, all the roads were out. I couldn't get here from Fort Collins. They got Big Thompson open in record speed, or 34, I should say, and then the federal government shut down, so I couldn't get in the park. But when I did finally get in the park, I went up to Wild Basin, and you know, if, again, if you remember what the lower part of North St. Rain was like below Route 7, there were just massive landslides and debris flows, and Button Rock and Ralph Price Reservoir had a lot of wood and sediment in it. Again. So I was, you know, Pretty excited to see what I was going to find up here. And I got here, I couldn't see a thing, I couldn't tell they were going to flood. I went to the upstream end and I started walking through the willows and I started to see a little bit of sediment, some large wood, but it was extremely resilient to the flood. There was no change. This is a, a photo in the early June when the willows are peeking out. If you want a, I don't know if I call it an Iron Man or woman, maybe a, a water man. And if you want a good challenge, put on a pair of chest waders and try to walk across this meadow at the Wild Basin entrance in June <laughs> without getting wet. It's really hard. Between the water and the willows, which are super dense, and now the moose, that, you know, where'd you come from? Uh, it's very difficult to move through them. So it's difficult for floodwaters, too. They slow down, they spread out. There's a lot of, to be a little technical, frictional resistance. It would be like me suddenly deciding I want to run to that back wall. There's some obstacles in the way. Uh, same thing with flood water going through this meadow. It, it really slowed down. So the more patchy or spatially heterogeneous the floodplain and channel are, the more resilient it is to these different types of disturbances. And just a really graphic illustration of this, a site in Idaho. This part of the river corridor was modified by beaver. You can see some beaver ponds, and these slopes are black because they burned. That was a few years ago. Um, we see the same thing in the Cameron Peak and East Troublesome and some of the other fires. The uplands, the free torch. But if there's, and, and I've been working in Little Beaver Creek in the South Fork for the, for the last few years, despite the name, there's no beaver there now. So parts of the riparian zone there in the, in the Cameron Peak fire, there was nothing green left. Uh, it was absolutely charred. But where there had been past beaver activity, even though the beaver hadn't been there for years, it looked more like this. There was still ponded water, and that floodplain area stayed green. One more thing I want to mention, because it's so important, and uh, now people are trying to figure out how to store carbon in landscapes. This is another one of those that looks a little complicated, but I'll walk you through it. On this axis is, just think of megagrams as a lot. Just think of a, a volume of carbon per unit area. Above the zero, this is above the ground. So it's large wood, it's living vegetation. 
Below the zero point, this is what's stored in the soil. You can store organic carbon in soil. Think about the rich black soil that you find in some places in river valleys. So each of these columns is a different segment of the river corridor. This is old growth forest with a fairly narrow valley floor. So not much in the way of the but orange is wood. So most of the carbon is stored in wood, very small amount of living vegetation. This is an old growth forest where there's multiple channels that branch and rejoin, like some of the photos I was shown for Uzo in North St. Grain Creek earlier. A lot more carbon still stored in wood. This is a beaver meadow, like wild basin. Most of the carbon is in the soil, it's very organic rich soil. But all of these are essentially beads. You get over here into the streams, there's not nearly as much carbon stored. So if you want to store carbon in the landscape, focus on those bead areas. And they're less than a quarter of the total length of channel in any river network. And we were doing this from the start of the rivers at the suburban pine lakes down to the park boundary. But they contain about three quarters of the carbon present in those valley bottoms. And this is the one that I find really stunning. If you think about rivers uh, in, in the Front Range, even the beads are still kind of narrow. They're mountain rivers. They're, they're not like the lower Mississippi. So they're less than 1% of the total area of the landscape, but they store almost a quarter of the carbon. They're disproportionately important. So if you want to store carbon, you focus on the beads and you focus on the river corridors. And um, to show you a little bit more of this, North St. Green, from Route 7 up to the Continental Divide. So the numbers I'm going to show you are the amount of carbon in floodplain soil. So SOC is soil organic carbon. ABG is just a, a common abbreviation for above ground. So what's in the, the living vegetation? <coughs> okay, so some numbers here. The beaver meadow, uh, there's a pretty high amount of carbon. This is megagrams of carbon per hectare. The units don't matter, it's just, it's a large number. This is what's in the uplands there. Um, one of those areas that's in common for forest, but has lots of log jams and multiple channels that branch and join. Again, a lot of carbon and not so much in the living vegetation. Sorry, this is a little bit misleading where I didn't explain it clearly. The green is the living vegetation. You go to the stream, so one of these laterally confined portions, there's a lot less carbon, there's less valley floor, and there's less floodplain soil. And then, have any of you ever uh, been up to, gosh, I just don't remember, it's Finch Lake uh, on Coney Creek in the Wild Basin. If you follow the trail, you go through some really wet meadows where even in August you can overtop your boots if you get off the trail. It's just always saturated. It's almost peat up there. So those have really high values of carbon. So again, this is in the, the um, basically the subalpine zone. And the pool age of this carbon, how long is it being stored in the club? And this is years before present, thousand to two thousand years. You have this material stored in the floodplain. So it's significant amounts of time on the human time scale, on the time scale we're concerned about for carbon storage. In the uplands, the soil, organic carbon, you know, we have kind of pathetic soils <laughs> compared to Iowa. Um, there's not much carbon, in them, very low values, and the trees, ooh, again, we're not living in the Amazon basin, so there's not a lot of carbon in the trees. It's mostly in those floodplain soils. If you go below Route 7 into the montane zone, it's drier, there's more frequent fires. What you're seeing is these pale stripes. This is Google Earth imagery after the 2013 flood, so we referred to before lots of debris flows and landslides down there. It's a much faster disturbance regime, so there's less carbon stored in the valley bottoms. We are getting values of 90 to 100, which are much lower than the, the last that I was showing you, and it's stored for a lesser period of time. After the 2013 flood, uh, I had a graduate student who had worked in this part of North San Green. He went back to his site and they weren't floodplain um, forests, they were boulder fields. The forest was gone and it was not a soil that stored carbon. So things turn over more rapidly there. There's also less in the uplands. So when you have a drier, more frequently disturbed landscape, you're storing less carbon. So again, if you want to Start thinking about carbon storage, focus on those wet bead sections at the higher elevations in the front range. These are, they, in some ways, the, the most 
valuable. All parts of a river network matter, but these have the spatial heterogeneity. They've got that lateral and vertical connectivity that we really have to disturbance. So when you have a fire, if you've got a series of beads, maybe you won't have flash floods and debris flows that kill people downstream or um, really alter drinking water supplies. They store carbon, and they're also places where you have a greater mass of living organisms. Um, we, I was part of a group that had a, a multi-year project in North St. Rain Creek, and we looked at old growth parts versus much younger areas that were simpler, and we found more aquatic insects, more riparian spiders eating those insects, more trout eating those insects. We found more biomass in the beets in those areas where these, I call them biotic drivers, but where the log jams and beaver dams really created the spatial heterogeneity of a lot of these functions. So you've probably heard of beavers as ecosystem engineers. Um, they're not the only ones, there are other plants and animals, but they, they modify the environment for their own purposes, but they benefit a lot of other species. So because they build dams and they dig canals across the floodplain, the beavers increase that connectivity between the channel and the floodplain, and the dams create that hybrid flow. There's a lot of surface water storage and, and a higher water table or higher groundwater in the river corridor. Has anybody seen the Fall River grazing exposure over the last few years? Um, some beavers moved in, and they've been going to town. It's sort of like what I said at North St. Brain. Just try walking across that floodplain in August or September, even when the flow is lower, in chest waders without overtopping them. It's remarkable. And this is one of the dams. If this is downstream, that's water pouring off the floodplain. The entire floodplain is inundated, and that's just returning into the channel downstream. So there's a lot of surface water being stored there at the surface in the shallow subsurface, in ponds, and again, in the vegetation itself. When you have a flood, it's going to spread out. It's going to move slowly through this very dense willow community in the sedges and rushes. So you're going to reduce the, the flood peak or the peak flow and increase the amount of flow during the dry season since it's coming along the way. going to store a lot of sediment. This is in Little Beaver Creek, so that tributary of the South Fork Cougar. This was taken last summer. These are old beaver dams and ponds that had been abandoned before the fire. Uh, all of the green that you're seeing on the valley floor is regrowth after the 2020 fire. Huge amount of sediment came down this uh, catchment during 2021 and 2022. A beaver dam and a pond is a really good place to store sediment and limit the downstream movement. And this is the type of really dark, organic, rich, carbon-rich soil that you get in beaver ponds. They also improve the water quality. Again, if you're slowing the movement, you, you're taking some of that nitrate out, plants are taking it up, and microbes. You've got more stable channels. If you concentrate all the energy of a flood into a single, fairly uniform channel, there's a lot of energy being directed towards the bed and banks, so and you can have more erosion. You spread that flood water out, you slow it down, the channels are probably going to be more stable. There's more habitat, and that supports a wide variety of organisms. These guys are kind of problematic for beaver, but this is wild basin, and that's the closest I've ever come. And you notice your hackles are up because I came out of the middle of my chest fingers like, Ooh. <laughs> Unfortunately, she didn't charge. Um, it's the fastest I've ever moved in chest waders. I got away and then I um, took a photo, but she was still a little perturbed. That's why the hackle grew up. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's the only place I've seen a certain organism in the park in this really dynamic beaver meadow, uh, including a river otter, which was really fun. So there's a lot of other organisms that the creatures would be really well for beavers. Are. Again, that increase in carbon in the soil. And there's a lot of evidence that there were far more beaver. I mentioned uh, in those mills. There are censuses of beavers in some parts of the park before it was a park in the 1890s, and the population density is much higher. If you ever hike down the trail from Poudre Lake that goes eventually down into the Poudre or, or Hay Creek, that whole upper uh, portion of the Poudre River Valley is just full of features like this. And what I've outlined here is an old beaver dam that's now a vegetative bird. This was the pond that, that's the flow direction. No beaver there now, but there are dozens and dozens of features like this. And in places you can see where the contemporary uh, Poudre, which is pretty small up here, has cut through them, and you can see the layers and the beaver chewed wood from the old dams. So, 
ecologists refer to alternate alternate states. You can have a beaver meadow or an elk grassland. And they, I think the name comes from Yellowstone, but it definitely applies to Rocky Mountain. Beaver meadow, I, the name is a little bit unfortunate because it's not a grassy meadow, it's a, a dense little community. But while the beaver are present, they build dams. Those are obstructions, so you get that ponding, you get the overbank flow into the floodplain. <coughs> Beavers also like to dig canals. If you do this exercise I'm saying going across these meadows, be careful because beaver canals are invisible until you fall on them. They're vertical and they're the width of the beaver's body. And they're all over the place. So overbank flows going into those, you get these multiple channels that branch and rejoin downstream. Willow, uh, aspen, birch. Um, um, alder really like that. And beaver herbivory, if my hand is a, a bunch of willows, an elk or a moose will eat the growth tips. And have you seen how many aspen and willows we have in the park that look like shrubs? You know, every tip has been munched. <laughs> That's killing those plants slowly. Beavers will take the, plant, the branch down there and the branch will sprout. It actually gets bushier with time. So beaver or bigger, you're eating the, the willows it does not kill them. So the beavers are very good at creating this environment that is favorable to willows, that's more beaver food and habitat, more beavers, more dams and ponds. So it's this nice feedback that's very stable and persistent. Because we're working in the park, we couldn't use truck-mounted drills, we use hand overs, but the deepest that we could get in this beaver meadow and wild basin and then get ages from what's called radiocarbon dating. 5,000 years old. So the beavers have been here continuously for at least 5,000 years. Okay, the beaver disappear. Um, historically, that was commercial trapping. Now it's out, being out competed by elk and moose. You go into a very different scenario that's this alternative state. So the beaver dams fall into disrepair. The flow is more likely to be concentrated in a single channel. This is beaver brook and other beaver meadows. Flow has more energy, it erodes that channel, cuts down, widens the banks. As the channel cuts down, the water table drops and the whole floodplain dries out. So this is upper beaver meadows outside of where they've got the grazing disclosures. And you can see some nice photos, ground photos, going back to the 1960s or earlier, where places like Marine Park and upper beaver meadows look more like this. So this is not geologic time scale, there's very recent change as the elk and the moose said. I've competed the beaver. But if nothing removes the elk or the, the moose, it's going to stay this way. It's, it's much simpler, it doesn't have that lateral and vertical connectivity, but it will persist. It's really hard for a beaver to build a dam there without any vegetation in those deep, narrow channels. So the Park Service is putting in what are sometimes called beaver dam analogs. They're human built beaver dams. Because it's a park, they don't call them beaver dam analogs because they don't want to use the word dam. So they call them, uh, I don't even know what they call them. There's so many acronyms. There's simulated beaver structures, there's paddles, which are close to system water structures. There's a bunch of things, but they're people building beaver dams. They, the idea is to try and slow the flow down and stop some of this channel erosion. And if you're really lucky, the beavers will come in and say, oh, we can fix that, which is what happened at Fall River. The beavers built their own dam on top of the beaver dam now, and it's amazing. They're, they're, doing, they're doing great work there. So if you're on this side of this alternative, it's more resilient. You've got nitrate being taken up, which we desperately need in these side of the park. There's more carbon storage, there's more biodiversity. The beavers are good things. A um, few years ago, I had a master's student who looked at the distribution of beaver in the whole state of Colorado using this tool, which has this lovely acronym of RAP, Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool. It just uses the characteristics of the river network and says, where could beavers build dams? This was developed by people at Utah State. This is the BRAT map of Colorado, your current conditions. Red is no good for beavers, mostly it's big rivers. They can, they can live there, they can build um, they can dig dams and banks, but they, they can't dam the river. So all the red areas, uh, this is dams per kilometer. There's none. The blue is the best. That, that's ideal beaver habitat. It's what you'd expect. Most of the habitat is in the mountains. There are beaver on the periphery over on the Colorado-Nebraska border, uh, but mostly they're in the mountains and the foothills. What's interesting, though, with this program, this is based on contemporary vegetation as mapped at a national scale. 
That database also has inferred vegetation at 1700 AD. So you can go back and say, what might the beaver occupation have looked like a couple hundred years ago? And now the red is changed. So it's going from um, fans per kilometer, a change of 15 or less under contemporary conditions. So basically red is really bad. It means we've changed the habitat, either the river flow, the river channel configuration, the vegetation, in a way that these places can no longer support beaver. And that's most of our state. Um, so I guess one thing I can say with this is appreciate the beaver in the park. There, there are beaver in the adjacent national forest, but not that many beaver in Colorado compared to what there were once were. So what people are doing again is beaving, building these beaver dam analogs, and I think some of the best examples are on Fish Creek, um, just just that way, but outside the park on the Chile Ranch. Uh, they were they, these were actually they look like real ones because they used beaver chewed wood, but these were beaver dam analogs that the beaver at Chile said, "Oh, we can do better," and they made them much bigger. Uh, Campbell Creek is up in the Poudre catchment. You can probably tell from the vegetational lower elevation and some of the others outside of Chile Ranch on Fish Creek. So this is one of the dams that the beavers fixed on Chile. Um, and it was amazing because it was a tiny little thing and then I came back a week later and it looked like this and it, that's way too deep to wait in. So ideally if there's some beaver around that they can um, take over when you give them a little head start or a little help. And I just wanted to say there, there are an awful lot of really good books on beavers. There aren't many books on log jams. They don't get quite the attention. Um, but uh, this is one that I wrote specifically about North St. Gray. And this is a really nice one that's a little more technical. I think this is the most delightful one in existence. It was written back in 84, but it is so much fun to read. The other one I give a big plug to is in Beaver World. Uh, you know, Enos knows this book, which is really fun to read. So I'll end there. This is not my photo, but it's a really lovely photo of the beaver and the Tetons. So just recapping, you know, we, we live, you in particular, since you live here in Essex, you live in this landscape that reflects literally billions of years of geologic history. The uplift and then the repeated erosion and uplift of the mountains. Sculpted most recently by those Pleistocene glaciers, and then it's been taken over by river processes during the last 10,000 years. But the details of those river processes are very strongly influenced by things like beaver and the presence of large wood. And mostly, what's happened since European settlement in the area is we've reduced those influences by removing beaver or creating a scenario where they're out competing because we have the big ungulates of elk and moose and we don't have the predators. And we're not doing this now, but there's a history of wood removal and deforestation in the park, and we are still doing it to a lesser extent in the national forests. So I'm not trying to make people feel bad by saying we're well, living in this impoverished landscape, although I feel that way sometimes. I want to make you aware of how much things have changed. It's a national park, 98% of it is wilderness, but it's not pristine in the sense of oh, nobody's ever done anything here. And I think that's really important for us to be aware of as we go forward, because we're not starting from some idealized wilderness condition. There's already been a lot of change. And we have to think very carefully about what we'll be in the future, uh, how to mitigate some of the negative effects of that change and how to restore some of the systems. So thank you very much. Well, that was fascinating. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, at Spring Lake, the little uh, trail from the parking lot to the lake was a little pedestrian bridge, mm -hmm. and the stream there seems to be filling in with sediment. It's much shallower, and there are fewer fish than there were just a couple of years ago. Is that sedimentation, or is the water level drop? You know? It's sedimentation because prior to 2013, there was a pretty nice beaver dam there. But then uh, that was one of the places in the park that had a lot of sediment movement into it during the 2013 flow. And I haven't been up there in the last couple of years, but I know the beaver dam had become inactive, I think because there was so much sedimentation. There's a lot of sand and gravel stuff that came down in the 2013 flow. Now, most of the, the flood effects were downstream from Estes Park, but um, places like Twin Peak or again, the, the Bighorn entrance station, uh, there was a debris flow in North St. Grain, upstream from the Beaver Mill, they brought a lot of sediment and took the trail, a portion of the trail out. So there were areas that did have a lot of sediment. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, in the Yellowstone Park with the uh, reintroduction of wolves, are there now more beavers? Oh yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an amazing story. Yeah, they've seen so many changes. And, and if you're not familiar, uh, it's not that wolves kill all the elk and moose, that they're not super, they're good predators, but they're not super power predators. They keep them moving. Uh, left to their own devices, elk and moose are like domestic cattle. Uh, they like to hang out in the riparian zone and just eat meat and eat and stay there. So they move the predators, the wolves keep them moving. They do, of course, kill some as well. And what they've seen in Yellowstone is a complete transformation of many of the river corridors. They've seen things like aspen and willow and some of the deciduous trees coming back that were overgrazed or overbrowsed by the elk, and I think it was mostly elk in Yellowstone. And they've also seen beaver come back. It, it, it's not, you know, bring wolves back it changes immediately some are not some river valleys are not recovering some are and people are actively studying that trying to figure out what makes a difference but yes if the path that's up in north park could just find its way down to Rocky Mountain, um, <laughs> or if the wolves that are going to be are they going to be reintroduced in the white river you can get up here without being hit on i-70 or something it, it will make a big difference um, you know, Rocky Mountain is a very small park compared to Yellowstone, and there's a lot more human pressure around it. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but um, it, it can only help because, and I, I'm not saying this to criticize the Park Service, but their management moves slowly. They have been, they know they have a severe moose problem now, especially on the west side, and they've collared them and they've been studying them, but they're not doing anything to control the population yet. And as a beaver centric perspective, I worry that by the time they do, it's going to be really in places like Wild Basin. I worked in Wild Basin for a decade and I saw the moose numbers increase dramatically. I saw the level of browsing of the trees increase dramatically. So I'm concerned, but you know, it's, we'll, we'll see what happens. Can you talk briefly about the barriers for um, beavers to be reestablished in the, in the area? Yeah, there's a um, for natural reestablishment, they there's a couple things. They the two year so when they're born, um, they they usually stay in their natal colony until they're two, and then they usually move somewhere else. That's a period of high mortality. Beavers are much more uh, vulnerable to everything from cars to predation once they're out of the water. Um, so they can they can travel. When we were doing that work in in uh, the University of Brain. Um, some of my biologist colleagues were sampling our parent spiders then to do that after dark. So they're going up the trail towards Thunder Lake in the, at, I think it was 11 p.m. because it was summer. And there's a beaver going up the trail. <laughs> they can move, um, but they, they are vulnerable. They can, they, they, I don't know how far they can move, but a few miles probably. Once they get there, um, it depends on competition for the beaver. They are territorial um, with their family groups. And they can be vulnerable to predation until they get a lodge or a den uh, established. They have to have enough food to see them through the winter. This is a bad time of year for beaver. They can lose 40% of their body weight. They, they basically cache. Um, if you've ever seen those stripped um, branches that the bark stripped off underwater, that's their winter food cache, but it's not as nutritious. They have a salad in the summer to eat more herbaceous vegetation. Um, so it can be a limitation of. Can they get to where their suitable habitat? It can be a limitation of can they get themselves ensconced in a lodge or a bank down quickly enough to be safe from predators? It's a lot of times it's a limitation of food. Um, beavers going into Marine Park, they better live in the grazing exposure. There's nothing else outside that would see them through the winter. And the Park Service is not relocating beavers. There's a lot of beaver relocation going on in Colorado and Wyoming on private land. On sometimes on forest service land, mostly on private land, is it's not regulated, but the park service doesn't want to do that. So the beavers in the park have to move on their own. Do you mind um, oh, saying, no, the, yeah. <laughs> saying the titles of the the other historic books, the ones you had said were from the oh, 1800s? Uh, yes. So what I um, these you mean, or, or the logs and the the ones from like eighteen oh, nineteen? Oh, I and... don't know what the titles are because okay. they're usually half a page long. But it's Fremont's journals, which are like eighteen forty to eighteen forty two. I mean that you know, was the Victorian titles. They go they go for half a page. 
And then Edwin James was the chronicler of the Long Expedition. Uh, his, his report, which is very well written, um, is a government publication, but it's online. Both of these are completely online. You can read them in digital format. Um, Fremont's has been reprinted many, many times. So there's lots of different editions out there. It's also very well written. Um, I guess I'll repeat a historical rumor. His wife was a very literate woman, and apparently she took her journals and made them um, more easy to read. I don't know if that's true, but um, have any of you heard the color of this card by Evan James on NPR? He was a really neat guy. He uh, he was he was very young when he came out with uh, the Long Expedition, and he he did all these great things. He took care of the horses and the dogs in the expedition when other people didn't care if they died or were starving to death. And then he went back to, I think he was from Pennsylvania, and he had an underground railroad station on his farm. Oh, and he, he, he translated the Bible into Ojibwe. So he's a fascinating <laughs> individual. Do you know what I'm talking about? Those Colorado postcards and NPR did a little bit. So they've got one about him I've heard multiple times. So I don't know the title, but it's Edwin James. You can look that up online and you'll find it. I'm curious about your current work. What do you and your grad students do? A lot of it is post-fire. Um, so we yes. are looking at what creates resilience and how that can be fostered. There's a lot of money right now coming into the Forest Service in particular for green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, there's different things that it's called. But it's the idea that, okay, we, we don't want more black powers. And you know, talking about the debris from the 2021 tributary through that killed five people in the uh, Canyon Peak fire area. Right? So what can we do? So we're focusing a lot on what creates resilience naturally and where you can put structures like the Brigham analogs or engineered log jams or other interventions in after the fire. It's, it's basically just slowing those downstream floods and debris flows that occur after fire. Um, that's all the stuff that I'm doing in Colorado. I have projects up in Montana on um, the Swan River. If you've ever had a chance to see the Swan River, it's just west of Glacier National Park. We've been working there for a few years because it's much, much larger than the Cooter of Big Thompson, and it's full of wood. It's one of the few places in lower 48 that's still like that. It's in the uh, Flathead National Forest, and it's a special management area. So it's you, you have to portage in many places. We, we work there with inflatable kayaks and the, the whole channel. There are multiple channels of branching you join, but more, many of them can completely block from huge accumulations of wood. So we're looking at how wood affects channel process and form. So that you can apply that to answer those other questions? Or yeah, and we'll see right now where to put the deeper dams and all that stuff, but it would take a lot of sentimentological study. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the work here is focused on that. Um, the, the swan is so big, there's no animal hunting in this part of Colorado. I mean, it's a big river with a lot of water before us. There, it's just trying to understand how rivers operated before we altered them so much. And I'm working with ecologists uh, and biogeochemists, so we're trying to understand some of the effects on nitrate and on uh, fish and aquatic insects of having this spatial heterogeneity created by big lodgings. So it's Sometimes I think of it as North St. Rain Creek, those photos I showed earlier, but on a much, much larger scale, like five times as large. A lot of the same processes, but bigger, and there's not that many places, and there's very few places in continental U.S. where you can study that. That's why I was working up in Alaska, too. There are more places up there where you can study that. Yes. So you support a lot more fever than and water certified. I mean, like, how big would it take to make much of a difference? Thousand. That is, um, to use the old phrase, that's the $64,000 question yeah. now, it's probably the $64 million question. That, that's a very important question of how much is enough, and we don't know. Uh, I'm just getting started on another project on Little Fever Creek that's a big collaborative project with people who are modelers. So we're going to make measurements at a couple of these, and then they're going to have models at the entire watershed scale and say, what if we have 30 of these extra versus what if we had five? We, we don't know right now how many we need. Uh, right now, a lot of the things that um, the various groups in the Forest Service are doing in the critter catchment, I'm most familiar with the Cameron Peak Fire area, are limited by access. So there's a lot of private land. Uh, are the individual landowners amenable to that? Some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, it's limited by road access. It's not so simple to build a beaver dam. You, need, you don't need 
really high-tech equipment that would help so you can have some motorized equipment and some road access within you know, a few hundred feet. So you're limited that way. Um, but there's a lot of ongoing experiments and we'll know more in a decade as to how we're going to do more. Well, that was great. Thank you so much. Uh, wait. Do you want to...